Welcome to Washita Mountain Podcast. My name is Mike. And man, it's been a morning. None of my cameras are cooperating with me. Well, it's more or less the microphones, not the cameras. So I hook up. This is not the camera I normally do this on. I can't get the DJI microphone to work on the other camera. I don't know if it's not charged. I don't know what. I probably left it on. So we are on the other camera. It should be fine. Don't worry. Oh, man. It rained all day yesterday and all night. And it's probably a soggy, wet mess out there. I do have to venture to town. i got to pick up some plywood, a few other supplies for the build. The kitchen build, if you watched yesterday, uh, yeah, I got everything tore out. I put a new outlet in. And uh, it's ready to continue on. So... I got to where I wasn't feeling good for, and this happens to me once in a while, I don't know what it is. I just got real hot and didn't feel good. But after about a half an hour, I was fine. And I'm fine. I don't hardly ever get sick. Nope. So anyway, yesterday, I kind of, in the last couple days, I, I kept telling you guys, I'm probably going to tell you about my, my friend Steve. <laughs> now, Steve's no longer with us. He passed away and... I believe November of 99, but he was a character, he was a, he was a character for sure, and before I even start talking about him, I remember one time, Steve, Steve was from Jamestown, New York, and I met him in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, we'll get to that, how I met him. But uh, I remember one time in particular, I had to pick him up at the airport in Las Vegas. I was living in St. George, Utah, and Vegas was the nearest airport. You, St. George has a has a airport, but, you know, back then, this was early 90s. It would have been way too expensive to fly in there. I actually flew my grandmother and mother in there. Oh, no, that was my girlfriend's daughter. What? It doesn't matter. How am I getting off on this tangent? So I went to, I mean, everything with Steve was an ordeal. So I went, I always, if I had to pick somebody up at the airport, I'd go early. You know, I went about an hour early. Uh, ring, you know, the flights are never early. They're always delayed or whatever. So I got there about an hour early, parked in one of them indoor parking garages, you know. And, and this is 1992. No, 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 it's not 92, it's 94, 1994, somewhere in there, 93 to 94, I don't know, man, the years, I think it's more like 93, because I hadn't moved to Vegas yet, I was still living in St. George, and I was living in Bay, I moved to Vegas in late 93, all right, get off the tangent, so I parked my truck, I got a 92 S10, I don't know, a little old man's truck, Hey, man, it was a year old, 20,000 miles on it. It was just nice. So I park it in this garage. I go on under the airport, and I'm sitting there. Back then, you did not have, this was pre-9-11, you did not have the security. So you were free to roam about the airport. You just had to go through the metal detectors, and that was it. There was no TSA, none of that garbage. So his flight got delayed. And a pretty good delay, like two hours. So I'm like, man, I am not going to sit here for two hours. I'm in Las Vegas. I'm going to go get something to eat or whatever. You know, there wasn't a lot of food choices in the airports at that time. Now they got food courts and everything. So I exit the building into the parking garage, and it dawns on me. I didn't, uh, rec <laughs> I didn't remember where I parked in there. There's so many levels and sections, and it's huge. Oh, my God. I walked around for an hour and 15 minutes looking for my truck. And by the time I found it, you know, it didn't have the key fob where you get the alarm and sound off. didn't have that. Hour and 15 minutes looking around for that thing. And by the time I found it, there wasn't enough time to go eat or do anything else. So I went back in, but I made sure... And that wasn't the first time I'd lost my one of my vehicles, uh, you know, in one of them things. You really got to take note of where you're at. I don't know how I got off on that tangent. 
All right, let's get let's get to Steve because he's quite the interesting character. I'm going to try to keep this short. I re-enlisted in the army in 1992. Yeah, 1992. It was like January, February. At the time, the MOS, which is your army specialty job, uh, was firefighter paramedic. Well, there was no openings, so I would have to go to another school, learn another MOS. And there was not a lot available at the time of what I really wanted. Uh, so they wanted to send me to Fort Lee, Virginia for supply school. It seemed that always come up. I'm like, well, let's get it over with and do supply and get back in. Well... I get orders, and there's plenty of advance notice of when the school starts. And, you know, I'm still a civilian. Uh, I, I, you know, I, ha I haven't went to the school yet. So until I go to the school, you know, I'd already been through basic. I already did one hitch. So I didn't have to do anything. So I knew what date. I think they said it was like August or something. And, and I was living in Oklahoma, Tulsa. That's where I grew up. So I have grandparents that live in Ohio. So my plan is I'm going to fly out to my grandparents until I have to go to the school. And I checked with the Army. Yes, they would fly me out of Cleveland. It was the nearest airport. So I said, well, all right, I'll just go spend that time with my grandparents. Uh, you know, I went there often as a kid, you know. When I reached a certain age and started working, dishwashing jobs, whatever, I'd save my money and I'd buy myself a plane ticket, you know, spring break or summer, go visit my grandparents. So this was no different. Uh, so I'm in there about two and a half weeks, two weeks before the school starts. And then I get a phone call that they've canceled the school <laughs> for that particular time. So here I am stuck in Ohio. I done moved out of my apartment in Tulsa. And I got to get some work, man. They don't know when the next school's going to be. So I got to get a job, but I don't want a job that's permanent, you know, because I don't know when I when they're going to call me and say, here, here's the next school date. So I go to one of those, you know, the Cleveland area. Uh, Cleveland area, there's a lot of work. There was then. So I go to uh, a temp agency, you know, day labor. And they send me to a plastic injection molding company, running one of them. And, you know, I get in there. It's one of them companies, if you do good, they're going to hire you. And it was an awesome company. I mean, these people were cool. They would, you know, the owners were cool. And that's how they would get their employees. If they seen that you work good, they'd hire you. And so they wanted to hire me full time. But I told them my situation. So I said, well, we'll just keep working you like this. Well, there was a guy there that I worked alongside. And man, I'm telling you, I ain't never seen a guy work so hard in my life. And his name was Steve. And again, he was from Jamestown, New York. And he was a character, man. Uh, he was one heck of a character. And but he would outwork anybody, and you know I noticed that. So I I had the company put him as my helper. Man, did we put out some volumes of product? Made computer keyboards and a few other things like that. Weird stuff. And you just you had to put these pellets in the machine, and then push this button, and and boom, then it go, and then this keyboard would come out, and then you'd have to toss it down to him and he'd take a razor knife and then clean it up you know there's little spots where the mold releases whatever ah whatever ah. take a breath man but steve had a secret steve <laughs> you ever known somebody that liked to drink but couldn't handle it a, a pure lightweight well that was steve um uh, after working with him about two weeks, you know, you got paid every day with that day labor. So we saved it up, I guess, for a while. And we didn't, if you went and got it, you got paid. Otherwise, you'd turn it in, you know. So we waited a week and we took a bus. Uh, this is in Rocky River, Ohio. If anybody's in the 
Ohio area, the Cleveland Metro, you know where that is. So we took a bus to downtown Cleveland to cash our checks. And <laughs> there was a bar next door. So Steve's like, hey, let's go get a beer. So we go in there. I ain't kidding you, man. About in the, the third beer, that man went from dead sober to... <laughs> he was one of them, but he would be like that all night. He wouldn't get any drunker. He just... After three beers, he's instantly drunk, and he's, oh, but I liked how the guy worked, and this is funny because I got home one day, and, and I'm still not hearing from the Army, still not hearing, and we'll get into that in a bit, I've got to have to get into it pretty quick, it's just getting long, so anyway, long story short, I get home one day, found out. A newspaper that I, the first newspaper I ever worked running the presses, had called. They didn't even, you know, it was just coincidence. They were looking for me to hire me back to run a press. And so I took the job. And that was in a town called Chardon, Ohio, which is a beautiful part of Ohio. Um, it's north east of the city. I mean, you, know, you get to eastern Ohio towards Pennsylvania, it's pretty nice up there by the lake and stuff. So they needed more help. So I knew Steve. And Steve didn't have no car. You know, Steve liked to drink. So Steve didn't have no license. And he took a bus as far as Cleveland would take him and hitchhiked the rest of the way. And there was an old man that was renting, renting rooms in town. So we each rented a room. And there was a bar right next to the house and the newspaper. Ooh, that man would get, and as drunk as he would get, you would, he could always walk. Most times, most times. So the army thing fell through. And so I didn't, I did re-enlist a little bit later. Uh, it was a weird situation. Uh, about a year later, I, I finally re-enlisted, but we ended up, I moved to, uh, they shut that paper down like four months after we started. And so then I got, back then, you know, there was no internet. So, but it was a big company that that newspaper was owned by. Um, it was one of the biggest in the industry. So we would just call around to the other papers that were in the company and uh, one in Minnesota needed help. So I went to Minnesota and got a job there of course they needed a little more help so i had them get steve out there they flew steve out and we rented a house we were roommates renting a house and <laughs> i come home one day steve's got all the furniture in the house up on the end the sofa's up on the end all in one corner and he's sitting in the middle of the room laughing his butt off i'm like dude what are you doing uh, but he was there's happy drunks, there's mean drunks, there's silly drunks. And he was all of the above. Every one of them. You never knew what, what to expect with them. Now, we didn't drink during the week because we had to work. And work night shifts. Well, that kind of puts a damper into drinking. But on the days off, made up for it. One particular time, it was probably, it was middle of winter. There was probably two feet of snow on the ground. And I come home, he worked in pre-press, I worked on the press, and they'd get off first. I come home, Steve's on the front porch, and it's got to be 15 degrees with snow on the ground. He's passed out cold. Well, he had went to the bar, it didn't take him many beers, you know, <laughs> to get drunk. So woke him up, man, it's a miracle the guy didn't freeze to death. He didn't have his glasses. He asked me where his glasses was. I said, man, I don't know where your glasses were. You know, he never did find them. Five months later, when the snow melts, I'm walking home from work because it was really close. He didn't, you know. And there's his glasses laying on somebody's lawn. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it, you know, this, this, this video is getting too long. But uh, there's so many stories with the guy. Uh, but he was just, uh, you know, a fun guy to be around, and he he was a smoke jumper in Oregon for a while, and he got in, the way he tell, told it was, he got into some diazinon, 
I don't know what it caused cancer in his stomach or something. And the so last time I seen him would have been May of 97 uh, when I went to the Denver Post. I was in Oklahoma. Like, guys, you wouldn't believe how many times I've moved around this country. Uh, I'm always here. I'm, I'm there. It's hard to keep up with in my mind. But uh, that was the last time I seen him, and then he passed away. I didn't even realize. I did not know he passed away until probably 2003. I finally got a hold of his mother because I had a job for him in Iowa. And his mother said he had passed away, and you know, that was that. But I, there's a few friends like him that followed me to new, different newspapers for a couple of years, and, you know, but yeah, he passed away in in November of ninety nine. Didn't even make it to his fortieth birthday. So, well, this is getting too long. Maybe we'll talk about Steve a little more. There are tons of stories with Steve, but uh, yeah, something else. Thanks for watching, guys. Happy trails.